We should. Uh, All right. You guys are alive. All righty. You the host. All right. Well, welcome to another T Rex talk. We're going to be talking about radio stuff. We tried to get Lucas to stay and do the intro, but he was like, no, you guys have to learn how to watch videos without me. And then I convinced him to stick around for the first five minutes, but apparently that was earlier because he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be talking about radios. Hopefully you saw the YouTube video that we posted uh, last week because it covers some basics and that will save you some time because we're probably going to be taking slightly more advanced uh, comments from folks. Uh, there, there are some more advanced questions that people have sent in. By the way, uh, you can feel free to chat on the YouTube chat, but if you send an email to trextalk at trex-arms.com, that's better because uh, it's easier for us to see that and doesn't get lost in the flood of Fs, which is what yeah. we normally get in the chat. Um, <clears throat> so maybe it'll be less if Lucas is not asking you guys. So T Rex Talk at T Rex Arms.com. Yeah, so we have a bunch of questions already. That's the other great thing about the emails is uh, we've been getting emails ever since we announced this a few weeks ago. And actually, we've been getting a lot of communications and radio-related questions in the past. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about. We don't have a great outline, so this mm -hmm. will be very question-driven. But we're going to be talking about <clears throat> some specific radios, pluses and minuses, some specific strategies. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing what other questions come up in the conversation. Yep. And again, we're trying to figure out what to do with these lives, uh, whether it should just be Q&A or whether it should be more conversational, sort of what content you guys find the most interesting and helpful. And uh, well, let's get let's get into it. Yeah. You've got a bunch of radios on the table. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, and I want to offer a disclaimer right at the front. Oh, that's so, a great idea. So people Assume. heard we were doing this live and they started sending in questions. And a lot of the questions are guru level. Like, what's yes. the best way to scan a large number of frequencies while you're on the move? Which is a great question, and it's one that we are totally not qualified or capable of really answering. I'm kind of prepared for that one, but the, kind, there is yeah, an assumption I mean, based on uh, the video that we posted last <clears throat> week that we are experts and, and we are gurus at this. And that is not the case, no. which is why we, last week's video pointed people in the direction of some actual gurus, so, some actual experts. So we do know some stuff. We have been sure, buying yeah. and collecting radios and playing with them for about 10 years, and we do know how to something about guns. So we have those, those, that overlap. Not all ham radio guys um, have that, um, but we're not gurus. So moderate your expectations a little bit. Um, but with that said, there is some helpful stuff that I think we can get into. Yeah, and, and I will say, I have done a ton of research on this, and so have you. And one of the things that is frustrating is we exist in a weird niche kind of between the gun and ham radio people. I want to say right off the bat, I have huge respect for ham radio dudes, but a lot of what they are doing is very interesting, nifty, experimental hobby stuff. And I'm all for that. But what I don't have time for is another hobby. I right. want stuff that I know will work and not, well, let's just right. play around and see what <clears throat> the E-bands are doing right now and is the ionosphere charged and maybe some freaky will happen and I'll talk right. to someone in China. Maybe we can get some tropospheric ducting going. <laughs> if, I mean, don't get me wrong, that is extremely cool, but I don't have time <laughs> yeah, we're not doing to that. do that so, personally. And what I'm interested in is more practical emergency comm, off-grid comm yeah. type stuff that is reliable and useful. And one of the annoyances is when I'm looking for that amongst ham radio forums, often I find people doing very cool, interesting, but completely unapplicable stuff to my use case. Yeah. And when you do ham radio research, you will run into that. Don't be discouraged, but just know that well, that's, that's and, the and thing that you're going to have to find is people who they got into this hobby because they love sitting in their ham shack and hand-winding balins for their homemade antennas to squeeze just a little more performance out. That's awesome, but I don't have time for that. Right. You don't have time for that. You may not have time for that and, either. <laughs> and, th and they look for features that maybe we are not looking for. So it's super common. This is a ham radio. This is, this is capable of analog and digital, and it is front panel programmable, so you can manually key in new frequencies and stuff. When you look at a business 
radio, like this Hytera here, they typically do not have those extra buttons. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is um, they assume in the FCC licensing that the operators of these radios are not actually qualified to make changes to the programming. So they do not want the end user changing it. All they have is a knob to choose between pre-selected uh, pre-programmed frequencies. And you might look at this and go, oh, but what if I want to, you know, I really want to be able to, to, to mix it up in the field. The reality is most people are not going to need that capability. Uh, and that's why we've actually been buying some radios recently for testing purposes. And these are all high terras that I'm testing. I haven't actually gotten to the testing yet. None of them are front panel programmable because in reality, if we distribute something like this around our shop for shop communications, most of the people do not need to change the, the programming beyond, hey guys, I'm on channel one, now I'm on channel two. Yeah. Um, so ham radios, some of those guys are very interesting, but not everything they want is really applicable in a, in the, in a field situation. So, um, and in the same, uh, on, on the flip side of that, a lot of the people who are buying business radios, mm -hmm. they are expecting, for example, their, their business band setups, which talk over the internet. That's not good for emergency communications right. because there's guys who buy radio systems that use uh, all kinds of very cool voice over IP tech that assumes that all infrastructure is going to yeah. be up and functioning when you report child vomit on aisle five or whatever. <laughs> um, and so that is something where those guys also don't have exactly what you're looking for. This makes it harder for you, the end user, to actually do your research because you have to have a better plan, which is one of the other things we talked about in the video, you have to actually decide who it is that you're trying to talk to, in yeah. what circumstances, yeah. with which difficulties, before you go out and build the system itself. Yeah, and it's... Studying this radio technology is very frustrating because if we could rewind the clock 30 years and you could pick up something like this UHF uh, analog radio, you know, it offers you something fundamentally different than it was available with other communication technology at the time. You know, there were POTS telephone systems and there were these and you could control this and not the, the POT system so much. And if the wires went down and you had this, you still had comms. But fast forward to today, this digital radio is really not that different than the old radios, but it you know, pales in comparison so much to a cell phone, yeah. which is basically a radio. It's a series of radios that are, have a bunch of really amazing capabilities built into it. And so suddenly this is really only better than a cell phone for very select specific things. Um, the biggest one is the backup capability. You know, mm -hmm. if the cell grid goes down or you're operating in an area where there is no cell grid, these come in great. The other place they're really fantastic is uh, ease of communication. You know, I know there's uh, walkie-talkie apps for phones. Those are, uh, some of them are pretty good, but they're typically not as convenient as a single push to talk that you yeah. can just nail anytime you want it, and it instantly communicates. There's no server lag, anything like that. There is actually some lag between some of these. The digital the modes. digital modes will have a bit of lag. Just a tiny bit as yeah. it's compressing and, and decompressing. And, yeah. Um, so you just you need to have realistic expectations going into it when you're getting radios and you just need to recognize what it can do and what it can't do. Um, a lot of guys I'm seeing on the internet, they, they're obsessed with the wattage of the radio. They think, oh, I'm going to go buy an 8-watt handheld versus a 5-watt um, a or something, and they think that it's going to dramatically improve performance. Uh, I want to touch on this because a lot of we've seen several questions come in about repeaters. Mm -hmm. Effective transmission range is not primarily based on the power of the radio. It's mainly the altitude of the antenna and the uh, antenna itself. And mm -hmm. then yeah. lastly, the uh, power. You can use a five watt handheld radio, like one of these, to talk to the International Space Station. And that's because you have perfect line of sight and with the right antenna, you can direct your, that radio's energy and collect the energy coming back and actually yeah. communicate. And so where we are in Tennessee is one of the worst places for radio propagation. Everything is trees. Everything is little tiny valleys. Hills and valleys. But there's not big mountains. I have a friend in Colorado um, whose home is up in the mountains. He's almost at the top of not the Rockies themselves, but a very high hill, uh, very high peak. And so he cannot see over the Rockies to the other side. 
but he has handheld radio communication with his wife as she goes all the way down the hill into Denver and probably a long ways out yeah. over the Eastern Plains. <clears throat> Just with these, because the line of sight is so good. Yes. Now, obviously, there is a limit to how far that power, that uh, that RF power actually goes. Yeah. Um, it does fall off, but line of sight is a super important thing. And that's why repeaters work so well. And that's why your cell phone works so well. Um, it is talking to a tower that's elevated and it gets a much better line of sight signal um, because just just the antenna placement of that cell phone tower. So yeah. that's something that's important. And, and that's where repeaters really, really start to improve communication capability because you are finding the optimum place to transmit from and now you're taking a, a really good antenna, hopefully, and you're putting it up, up high there. And so these here in Tennessee, um, you're going to have half a mile to two miles range as a general rule. Um, just depending on what val you know, are you in the yeah. same valley as the person? <laughs> Which um, are clogged with trees and nothing and, and blocks. And it's, it's really interesting. Like leaves. You know, I remember once I did a test, I, you know, I drove off on a motorcycle and it was very interesting. I was specifically testing UHF versus VHF. And at about, I think it was about a mile, I, I, it was starting to fail. And there were hills in between, not big ones. But it was very interesting because I'd be like, oh, the UHF radio can't communicate back to home anymore. But the VHF one can. And then I'd go another 50 yards and, oh, the UH, UHF can talk now, but VHF can't. And it was very spotty. Yeah. I, was, I was at that, that limit. Um, but another interesting time, I was um, driving somewhere and my brother was on top of a hill and we talked for miles because I would I would get into a place where there was that coverage and then I could talk to him and it, it was just it was really weird because I would think oh I've lost him yep I went too far and then a minute later I could talk to him and so you just kind of have to be aware of that when you get into radios there's these these figures that everyone likes to advertise with and the little bubble pack radios are infamous for this, for this they're like 35 mile range and the answer is no 35 miles to the space station maybe but in real world conditions you're talking one yeah two miles without a repeater or something like that now uh, there are these simplex repeaters which are basically nothing more than um, a radio attached to a recording device that can then auto play back and so if you put a simplex repeater up on a hill which is just a radio in this old 50 dollars device that can give you huge uh coverage but there's this delay because basically it would be like if I put I Isaac on the hill. I record a 30-second message. That radio hears it. Yes. And then replays it 30 seconds later. Yes. And so I hear it again. And so do I on the other side of the hill. But then hears it on the other side of the yeah, hill. Yeah, it would basically like if there was a big hill in between Isaac and me and we put someone on a hill in the middle and Isaac says, could you please tell David this thing? And then he tells me that's basically what it's doing. But it's a very cheap way to get coverage if you're not really concerned about um, urgent communications or time-sensitive communications. But some of those repeaters can also do other things, like they can store messages, and you can actually use uh, DTMF signals. So this radio, oh, yeah. frequency mode. This radio can actually transmit DTMF tones, and you could actually transmit tones like that and it would replay the last message or two messages back or whatever so yeah. there's some cool things out there that can improve performance um now i will say there's some cool things out there that will perform well but it feels like you're living in the 1970s yes. with the old analog telephone system and that is where a lot of radio gear is there's some very cool stuff that you could be doing with this radio stuff if you have the digital tools for it and that's what a lot of guys are doing now. Where did that uh, Raspberry Pi go? Okay, so this right here is a Raspberry Pi, which is a $30 computer, but it's a full-on computer with USB ports and Ethernet and everything. It would be so easy for this computer to live inside of an HF radio and do a whole bunch of cool stuff. And when you see a lot of guys experimenting, this is exactly what they have sitting on top of their uh, HF radio. I didn't bring mine, uh, my mobile yeah. uh, here, but you'll see a bunch of rigs where this is inside of a little case and connected by four cables to the radio and doing a whole bunch of very cool uh, radio management and codec stuff. And uh, 
boy, it would be so easy for some of the ham radio manufacturers to just add a few of these modern features. I, I was joking that this feels like a uh, an old Nokia phone. It really is like the first Nokia phone that I bought, which was also, by the way, the first Nokia phone that had Bluetooth. Um, it is something where Bluetooth has been around for a while. Not a lot of radios have it, but it is an extremely useful thing. So not only can I connect this radio to my regular Bluetooth earbuds that I'm using while they're also connected to my phone, but I could have this little Bluetooth push to talk button anywhere. And it solves a lot of cable management problems. I'm not a huge fan of Bluetooth for everything, but it's been a standard for an awfully long time, and it is only now starting to show up in radios, which is kind of interesting. So I've got, I've got some questions here that I'd like to jump over to. Um, mm -hmm. So the one that we're getting is, how do you talk? Like, how do you get licensed to talk to other people? And there's a couple different ways to do that. So if you go into Walmart and you go buy bubble pack radios, uh, those little ones, those are what's called family radio service. And actually, licensed. I think I covered that pretty well in the video. Okay. So let's just say... Well, I'm still getting questions about it. I guess they should go, go they watch They should the go video. watch the video. But basically, yeah. there are channels that you can broadcast for free using MERS. minimal power. Or for FRS. There's FRS, there's MERS. You can GMRS. buy GMRS license, which I did not talk about in the video. And it's good for one family. It's like 80 bucks for five years for one family, something like that. Yeah, and that lets you use the FRS frequencies with slightly more power, basically. And you can do, I think, a repeat. You can do GMRS repeaters. You can't build your own. You can use one if there's an existing one. Yeah. I've seen guys build them. Okay, you can build your own GMRS, or GMRS the, repeater if you have a ham license. You're not... Apparently, your license doesn't allow you to build it. I don't know. Now, uh, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, it kind of depends on how much of a bootlicker you want to be. There are an awful lot of issues related to radio licensing that are very gray and fuzzy. Some of those are related to the way the technology has changed faster than the regulations have changed. Yep. This is, there's, there's some fuzzy ones, and also the way that the FCC certifies stuff. So I'm seeing a bunch of people asking, can I buy military radios? Yes, you can. They're not FCC um, certified, so you can't use them for certain things. You can use them for amateur radio things, but yeah, how, how, how rigorously are these FCC certifications actually being enforced? Generally, they tend to be enforced on companies. If companies are selling a product uh, to a group, to large groups of people that is not certified for the thing that they're advertising it for, the FCC goes after the manufacturer. End user FCC stuff, that is a different story altogether. Yeah. But that is, so, so ham radio license is the next one. Ham radio license, you're allowed to use non-FCC certified gear because it is your responsibility to make sure that it is actually not interfering. Right. In order to get the license, it's like 20 bucks to take the test. It takes about four or five hours to go and study for the test. There's some handbooks out there. They're probably out of date. But basically, it's an accelerated handbook on everything you need to know in order to pass the test and then there are uh, phone apps that are basically practice tests and I just, would go they, with the practice test the practice tests are really cool because it gives you the the app gives you the pool of questions and then you just work through those questions and as you are successfully answering them it starts to not show you those questions anymore until you basically are just acing all the questions in the in the pool the pool for the basic level I think is like 250 or 300 questions um, and the pool of questions for the advanced um, cert is like 900 questions. It's, it's yeah. harder to pass. Yeah, um, so you generally the way that it works is you pay 20 bucks and you take the easy test. If you pass it, you take the next level up. If you pass that, you take the third and final boss test um, for the same 20 bucks. Now, the issue is that there's very few uh, ham clubs that are actually doing the testing right now because of COVID-19. Right. There are online tests, but they're generally awfully full. So it's just sort of a question of which ham clubs actually want to get organized to do online testing at this point. Um, but there's a video, uh, or there's a link in the video that I posted a few days ago that tells you where you can actually look for uh, online testing sessions. Um, and once you have your amateur uh, license, you can then transmit on a whole bunch of different bands um, not just VHF and UHF, but HF bands that do super cool yeah. stuff. But 
most of that is not going to be practical for the person that just wants to talk after a tornado or something like that. So yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about what gear is good or what we've used, what we've had good success with, um, kind of some lessons learned there. Um, yeah, people are asking. So obviously, bow fangs are pretty ubiquitous. Here's an actual. This is five R. Yeah, this is this is a UV five R that we bought right after they came out, and they were the new pop. They were revolutionary because they came out and they were like sixty bucks. Mm -hmm. And there were some Wotion radios that were like a hundred before that. And otherwise, if you were a ham radio guy, you had to spend like a hundred, two hundred bucks to get a a Yesu or a Kenwood or something like that, an Icom. Um, and so these were just incredibly cheap, and the expectation was that they would die uh, pretty quickly. And you can see from, maybe you can see, <laughs> um, the buttons. I've worn the buttons down on a number of these. Um, it's lost its knob, but it still works. Um, it currently has a shoulder mic hooked up to it, and we'll talk about that in, here in a little bit. Um, we've actually found that these Chinese radios, for the most part, are incredibly durable. Um, they have some minor issues that yeah. would be a big issue if you were a, a ham radio guy needing really finely tuned equipment. Or, or so this radio here, new, costs, I think it's $800. If you got an $800 radio and it had some little flaw, you'd be pretty upset probably. But if these are now like 25 bucks, if you get one of these and you get four and one of them has its onboard microphone die, that's unfortunate but it's not that big a deal. And that's actually what happened. I got two of these, the microphone port on one of them died. And so I just used a speaker mic continuously after that. And it, it never even bothered me. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things about them that <clears throat> if yeah. you compare them to a radio that costs 10 or 20 or 50 times as much, like there's this. some unacceptable stuff. But yeah. if you want a $25 radio that you can program and hand out to people that, uh, yeah, that's, that's, pretty hard to beat and yeah. Baofeng has continued to improve their quality control and they have rolled out several different so. models of radio they've rolled out a ton and that's actually yeah. one of the problems in the old days there was just this there were just a couple they had this one they had the uv3r they had the the triple eight uh which is great um and now they have just all kinds of stuff <clears throat> and mostly the quality has been really good you know like i had one of these that had a microphone die um we've discovered that if you put one of these radios, these BF triple eights, um, you can get these for like 10. 10 bucks on Amazon. We've discovered that if you leave one of these on for about a year on the charger, it starts to go wonky. Um, but but we've had these drug through the mud. Like this one has some mud encrusted in the in the micro in the speaker port near the speaker area. Yeah. Um, I had one guy drop one in a toilet once, and after it dried out for a couple of days, it kept working. Um, we've had really great success with these triple uh, eights, but they do eventually die. Yeah, but they're ten bucks a pop, and so. And I want to talk about another thing. So we should talk about Motorola at some point. Yes, there's a lot of Let's politics involved. Well, one <laughs> of the other things that I was going to point out is this radio is awesome, pretty awesome, but you don't have the software to program it. Right. These radios are kind of cheap and nasty, but the software for programming them is open source and the programming cable is about $12. Yeah. So practically speaking, practically speaking, this Baofeng is really awesome. So Motorola is Motorola is really interesting. So this is a XPR 6500. Um we've gone out on eBay and we bought a few different Motorola's as props for photo use. And I've also and to experiment, and to right? experiment with, but I've so far never gotten farther than the programming. And the reason for that is, um, even for radios that date back to the early '90s, Motorola still is incredibly possessive of that programming software. Like you, it has to run in, on a computer that runs DOS, but if you try to pirate it and put it on the internet, they will come after you with their lawyers. Um, it's very, very hard to program these. So this one here, the 6500, is popular with hams because it actually has a full keypad on it and a screen. So theoretically, it's front panel programmable. But if my memory serves correctly, you have to go buy the software from Motorola and then get a special like endorsement on your license to disable that lockdown on it so you can actually open up the front panel and make it front panel programmable. 
basically they've locked these things down extraordinarily and it makes sense because this is a like this radio here is what our local sheriff's office uses um, they issue them to, to entities like that they don't just want people you know either ripping off the you know plugging in and pulling the data off or changing the programming or whatever um, another frustrating thing about Motorola is they're incredibly expensive and Motorola as a company and I kind of get this they really appear to not want their used radios to go uh, on the the used market so I've heard about departments large departments they'll have a radio like this one and I think this one was like a thousand dollars is it like a thousand dollars new um, I got this one for I think a hundred dollars or 150 on eBay um, but they're they're uh, XTR radios um, and their other Apex radios, those are really expensive. Some of those I think are like $5,000 or $8,000 per radio. Mm -hmm. So they'll take these really expensive radios and an apartment is, it's time for them to upgrade. They have this fleet of a thousand radios. Motorola comes in, they buy up all the used radios and then shred them. And the other thing that's kind of shady about this is normally a department wouldn't I mean how does a department buy five thousand dollar handheld radios for their individual officers? And the answer appears to be they use uh, federal grant money. Yeah. So typically public safety grants that I've seen are a ninety ten split. Local agency puts forward ten percent of the money. FedGov puts forward ninety percent. So that five thousand dollar radio is actually only costing the fire department five hundred bucks. FedGov is is footing the the remaining forty five hundred. And, and so Motorola has started creating these radios, and they're amazing when you look at the feature set and the fe and what they can do and how durable they are. And they're eight thousand dollars for a handheld radio. And someone asked a little bit ago about the the PRC one fifty two that the military uses. I have seen one for sale once. I think they're they're out there, and it for would sure. be and and they're they're priced similarly. Yeah, um, and if you were but without to... the encryption module. Correct. Now, I have also talked to people who have gone out and gotten pricing directly from Harris, um, and they're awfully expensive. Um, yeah. You can, it, you can get them, you can run yeah. them, and they have some advantages. But the main advantage that most of the military gear has is it's literally bomb-proof, in theory. EMP-proof, um, stuff like that. It's EMP-shielded. It has a whole bunch of very cool uh, durability features, which you pay for in money, but also in weight. Yeah. And they often have very flexible power supply and battery stuff. And they, you can take advantage of those, but a lot of the other features you are not set up to actually take advantage of because you can't use the encryption modules, even if you have them because you don't have the programming stuff a lot of the times. Uh, and then they have some very cool accessory attachment options, which you also may not be able to use because you don't have a Blackhawk helicopter or a Humvee system to plug it into so if you know why you need one then that's great if you don't know why you need one then you really don't um yeah the only thing that you would get out of it is how durable it is and how uh flexible the power options are so yeah right okay so we're getting a lot of questions on encryption and that's something that we would like to talk about uh at least briefly we have started testing a little bit of stuff with DMR. We haven't really done anything with, I haven't done anything with encryption yet. But that's... No, it's kind of radio dependent. It is. Like how, how much? Because there's several levels. Right. So the, the good news is, the bad news is, it's hard to legally do encryption. Um, basically, you have to be on a, on a business band frequency to actually encrypt your comms. Now, if you're using ham radios, you can do digital modes of communication and... Practically speaking, for a lot of people, that's going to function kind of like encryption because, like, we should say, you know, we should ask, what are we trying to accomplish? Like, yeah, and you, you were making a comment earlier before we started broadcasting. The encryption that you can put on handheld radios does not buy you security. It just buys you privacy. For the most part. It's kind for of like putting, it's kind of like putting a fence around your backyard. It's going to keep someone from looking in conveniently, but if they've got a drone, they can put the drone up. And uh, if, they're, if they're technically savvy... Um, they can record your comms and then crack the encryption. Um, now, and it's really not how many that people... hard. Like P25 encryption, like regular uh, and, public and, safety and stuff. DMR. This laptop can break it. And yes. there's tools out there on the internet that will allow you to do that when plugged into 
an Some, SDR that's like yeah. this. Prob I haven't <clears throat> done it, but probably a $30 SDR right. is enough. Maybe they'd have to spend the exorbitant fee of $200 to get a better SDR. So, but. so the that's the bad news. <laughs> so in the old days, there were these analog radios, and it was you could get these proprietary scrambler modules that, would, that you'd add to your radio, basically, and it would give you functionally like encryption. Uh, but it was very primitive. Um, now, uh, and, and it's legally hard to do or more challenging to do. The good news is now there's all these. There's yours over there. I've got. I've got the digital modes one are, here. are are definitely Here's one. more private. They are yes. more secure, but and, but it's safer to just say more private. And, and well, once you add encryption, they become more private still. And it's to just sort of depend on what your threat model is. If you are planning. Uh, to invade the United States, and you're going to go up against the NSA and so forth. Don't assume on have uh, that you're going to have secure comms with right. anything like this. But if you want your next door neighbor to not listen in on your range chatter, then yeah, just being on DMR is going to make that way tougher. Well, <clears throat> or encrypted is going to make that way tougher yeah. for people to just eavesdrop. Yeah, and, and so the bad news is it, it's fairly hard to do. The good news is it's getting a lot easier and more affordable. So like this TYT radio, I think this is an M8, uh, uh, MD380. That's a 380, yeah. Um, it's like 100 bucks, and it has digital modes, and I think it has 40-bit encryption built in. So it's, it's becoming a lot more accessible. Now you will need that license if you want to do it legally. Um, as a note, you know, we're, we're mentioning that there's laws pertaining to this. It's pretty rare... For, cert, for enforcement to happen on certain bands. Um, I've only heard of one case. I'm not saying that's, there's not more than that, but I've only heard of one case where someone was actually busted for incorrectly using the family yeah. radio service. And that was, I believe, a fire department that was issuing those little bubble pack radios to all their firefighters and using those instead of proper solid radios. Um, and so they got busted for that. Yeah. But it's a lot of the now, if you go and you try to use military frequencies, or you go jump on the local fire or police oh, yeah. frequencies, so we should they will get grouchy really little. fast. Yeah. So the way that you get in trouble is, it would be pretty hard for you to take a radio, which is not set up for amateur radio, and then use it legally. But the only issue is that the radio wasn't meant for that. On the other hand, if you start broadcasting on military frequencies, or prison frequencies, or Walmart frequencies, or fire or police frequencies. The FCC will hear about that really quick, and they will take that very seriously. Yes. So getting your ham radio license is a very important thing to have for messing around. Uh, but the other thing that's really important is that you, you know the rules uh, so that you're not actually uh, getting caught doing something that's bad and technically dangerous. It would actually be problematic in many ways to interfere with the radio traffic of your fire department, say. Yeah, um, they that would be that would be not good on a whole bunch of levels. Not just legally, uh, not just penalty, but on a whole bunch of levels, it would be good to yeah. not interfere with the work that they're trying to do. It's it would, it's basically like jamming, and we've encountered this many times where some firefighter has a radio, he sits on the transmit button, and no one else can suddenly talk. no one else can talk because there's this radio transmitting all the time, and maybe you can still transmit, but it's going to be completely garbled by the engine noise. And conversation noise that you're hearing, um, so don't don't do that. You know, if you're gonna, you know, you should know the laws and you should know where they treat it very seriously and stuff. But yeah. basically, you can do digital, but you're probably and encryption, but you're probably gonna need to do business band in order to do that. Yeah, which that's the best need. easiest way. And and it sounds like it's pretty easy to do that. You just need a business reason to get the license, and then um, it's 160 bucks, I believe, something like that yeah. for a an itinerant frequencies license which is what you should get probably get um again you should have an articulable business reason to get the license they want it they want to see that in order to grant it um yeah. but if you started like a if you started a shooting club say and you went to yeah. them and said we have a shooting club we want to be more organized on the range for safety that would that's legit even if you're not an llc or a corp you, right. you technically don't need that um, there are um, several examples that people send in, like um, Boy Scout groups that yeah. are actually able to get business band radios yes. on that basis, that they are troop number such and such, and for safety, they need yeah. to use these radios. So if you're looking into radios for comms, for emergency purposes or whatever like that, um, I, would, I would advise you to steer away from Motorola's 
because they're such a hassle to work with. They may not really give you a whole lot in terms of reliability and durability, and the price premium is significant enough that you could go get a whole bunch of radios like, like this uh, UV82 <clears throat> for the price of one Motorola, and it's probably just not gonna really help you all that much. Oh, hey, all right. distractions. This just I'm, magically I'm, I'm, here. I have to get, I'm getting ready for tomorrow. Yep. So, right. right. so you, you wanna chime in on radios? Radios good, uh, radios bad? Ra radios um, are cool. Okay, Another, great. you heard yeah. it here. So I, we have different <laughs> perspectives in the company on certain issues, and I'm more of the budget perspective. Um, Another thing a lot of guys want to do is they want the full comm setup. Oh, we should talk you know, about they, that. They well, have Lucas the radio. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they want the radio, they want the push to talk, and they want the headset uh, connection. And that's, it's really frustrating. Mostly, well, it's, many, it's frustrating for many reasons. Number one. It's expensive. Well, number one is <laughs> it's actually technically complicated because connecting a whole bunch of stuff from a whole bunch of different manufacturers together is technically complicated. The right. plugs are different, but yes. oftentimes the voltages and resistance and everything well, is very different. Well, yeah, like, okay, so most Chinese ham radios use what's called a Kenwood-style plug, and it's a two-pin plug, and the pins are a specific distance apart, and one of those is for your microphone, and one of those is for your speaker, and that's more or less standard. But the Motorola's, they have a, their own proprietary, I, I need a screwdriver to open this up, they have their own multiple proprietary connections on them. These three Hyteras I have here, each one of them uses a different connection. This one here uses something that's like a Kenwood plug. It's two pin, but the pins are much closer together. Um, so that's the first problem. Connecting whatever it is you want to use to your radio is challenging because you almost have to start with the headset and work your way down to the yeah. radio and then like, well, I can use these radios and that's it. The good news is there's a bunch of people that do make the adapters. It yes. used to be very tricky to get the more uh, tactical kind of way of setting things up. It used to be super hard to do that because mm. these companies had never heard of or thought about EarPro and there was no nothing in the middle. But there's companies like Disco32. There's a bunch of people that make adapters. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the adapters are complicated because there actually has to be some electronics in the way. Yeah. It's not just a cable adapter. This the signal actually has to be changed. Yeah. Like the, maybe for everything the to work. maybe your headset has a high or low impedance microphone on it, and the radio. If you piped that signal into your radio, you would not hear it, and so changes yeah. need to happen. My APRS cable has. A bunch of microchips in the middle so that my phone yeah. can so, talk to my radio properly. So that's this is expensive and complicated to do. It's getting easier, right. but you should also really think about your end use case. I have a solution to all this that not everybody likes because it's not cool. It's not very tactical. It's not tactical, but it's much more flexible. My favorite thing to do for this sort of thing is either... Bluetooth earbuds that go underneath my ear pro or um, do you have any of the earbuds? Yeah, there are earbuds with push to talk well, setups that okay. plug into here. So and a, those can go under ear pro. So a huge number of firefighters and police use shoulder mics. And um, so they plug into the port on the radio. And because they're so widely used, it's pretty easy to find um, a shoulder mic to match whatever radio it is you want to use. Uh, Prime, P-R-Y-M-E, they make some pretty high quality stuff mm -hmm. um, based on my observations and small amount of testing. Um, and many of those shoulder mics, um, it has a microphone and a push to talk button and a speaker all in one. So that way you can put your radio under your turnout coat, for example, and then just push the button here and your radio is protected yeah. from the elements. And, and think about what's practical because a lot of guys they look at a picture of a special forces dude at a very high level, and they're like, I must have this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece. Right. He has two radios. Clearly, I need two radios. And it's like, well... Or some of the really cool push-to-talk boxes have multiple inputs and outputs, and they do super cool things like plug into two radios so you're on two different nets. Yes. And also have cables so that when you jump into your Black Hawk helicopter, you pull a thing down and plug it in, and now your headset is part of the, rate of the yes. whole helicopter intercom. That's awesome. 
it's really super but, cool. And I would love to geek out over how incredibly uh, effective some of the military radio systems are. But do you need that? Or would a shoulder mic with an earbud underneath your ear pro work the same way? And then the other cool thing about this sort of hybrid setup is I spend a huge amount of my time not in full kit. When I go to the store, it's very handy to have my phone on me so I can communicate. And I could have this in my back pocket and I could be on my radio comms at the same time. Yep. So now I'm on radio comms all the time without having to have my full cable management rig and, and helmet set up. And a full headset. So think about what it is that you're actually planning yeah. on doing. So And I, uh, if you're doing stuff that you're not planning on doing, then you're probably not going to be wearing your full kit. Yeah. So I think for a lot of people, a shoulder mic would actually be a really practical thing. And then it has an earbud. Usually it has a, a 3.5 mil jack for, for headset or earbuds. Um, and that would get you a huge percentage of the capability. Now, the connectors are not screw in usually, which is something that like the Motorola that I have here, when you clip on your shoulder mic or other attachment, there's actually a screw to lock that to the body of the radio, which is great because that way you're not going to have it getting jerked out when you're doing stuff in the field. Um, the Kenwood plug does not have that usually. It's just friction fit. Um, but you know, if you took this and you stuck this down inside a mag pouch on your carrier, for example, it's not getting jerked out, uh, probably. So, yeah. um, so I feel, think, think about all of the parts of your system. Don't just look at a picture of a seal on the cover of his, uh, best-selling book and then go out and look for airsoft gear that looks the same. Try to figure out what you're actually going to be needing to do and wanting to do right. as you figure that out. So yep. I, I will say that I am really enjoying the Bluetooth freedom. I was not a fan of Bluetooth, but the fact that I can have multiple push to talk buttons on different pieces of gear, this can be in a bag, this can be anywhere, and okay. then I can talk to it so, from here is cool. So you've played around. I have not used Bluetooth and radios yet. Yeah, it, I mean, it. I haven't tested its limits, but I've definitely enjoyed how seamless it so is. So that is a, a Bluetooth push-to-talk button. Right, and it's paired to this radio. And then is it paired to your earbuds? Yeah. Okay, so that could you could throw that in your backpack. Mm -hmm. You could have, can those earbuds be paired to your phone also at yes. the same time? So this these are, these are $50 uh, Bluetooth earbuds, and they're from DigiNext. They go underneath EarPro pretty well. Uh, the you would super need compact, high cup. yeah. The super compact ones are not like Howard really Lights would not work. They're okay. okay. They're not comfortable for a long time. But the bigger cups, great. And then, so now I'm on comms, and if I throw on gear and EarPro, I'm still on comms. And this can live in a backpack and can be 20, 30 feet away, and I can still hear it. And then, this could go on a rifle, and it could just be wherever, or it could be on my belt, or it could be wherever. So yeah. I've, I see a lot of guys putting these on their steering wheels and connecting these radios to the uh, the Bluetooth setup in their in their cars. So I was skeptical, and there's obviously problems with Bluetooth, but it's very cool. And uh, it's coming to more radios. ICOM announced a couple of days ago a new line of professional radios that's probably in, uh, I'm not sure what price range, but they all have built-in uh, Bluetooth modems that send uh, ATAC, uh, or CivTAC data to your phone. So the connection between your radio and your phone for data packets to talk to ATAC is something that happens over Bluetooth as well. So I see more and more of this coming. Uh, it's not going to be on the amateur radios uh, for a while, but it's definitely coming to the professional radios as more and more people um, are using stuff like ATAC and CivTAC, which is another thing I want to talk about. I've been playing with CivTAC, but... <sighs> And it is just like ATAC, which I've used in the past, but it is a pain to set up because there's not a magical cloud-based server that just makes it all work the way that Google Maps or any of the other things do. Right. So let's talk for a few minutes about what we recommend people buy. And we've kind of we've sure. touched on this a couple different times, but from my perspective, there is a significant rate of diminishing returns with handheld radios. Yeah. You know, the first thing you want is something that operates when there is no cell network. And you get into that club as soon as you get a Baofeng 888. 10 bucks. For 10 bucks. 
Then you have, hey, I want to be able to, in an emergency, actually talk to my fire department, assuming they are not haven't already gone digital. And um, by 2025, I want to say it is, they're all, every, all public safety is supposed to be digital. There's a couple of reasons for that. And one of them is you can fit twice as much traffic mm -hmm. in, a, in a given amount of bandwidth with digital versus analog. So in congested markets, they need that. Um, but like with this, I could talk to my fire department, not my sheriff's office or my um, police department, but I could actually communicate with my fire department with this. Or I could go over and listen to the NOAA weather radio. Or um, you know, I could jump around and do different stuff with it. This or is 25 bucks. Or MTRs or ERAs. There's a bunch of emergency ham radio guys. Yes. And that stuff's all analog and yeah. open and everything. So this gets you into that game. This gets you a couple miles of reliable communication. These radios, for the most part, will not die if you get them wet or if you drop them. Um, one of these radios here, I think, has a cracked screen because one of my children dropped it, but it's the only one that's actually suffered any real physical damage from being dropped. And, and it's still working. Yeah, and it still works. <laughs> um, this gets you a lot. The digital starts to get you more. It starts to get you a, a higher guarantee of privacy if you really want privacy. Uh, if you're on a yeah. canoe trip, do you need privacy to say, hey, paddle on over here. I need another, well, you shouldn't be drinking beer on the water, <laughs> but that's paddle, apparently on, rules. paddle on over here. I need to pass you a child. He's being obstreperous in this canoe. Well, you, the other thing that you <laughs> get with digital radios is this also does analog. So everything yes. that the analog radios can do, this will also do plus DMR. Now, one of the annoying things about digital is there isn't analog and digital. There's analog and then a bunch of digital modes. There's DMR, there's D-Star, there's Fusion. They don't interoperate with nope. each other. It's a real shame. If you love Yesu, which I do, you have to use their digital thing, which I don't love. And that's why I have an Anytone instead of a Yesu for a digital handheld because right. I wanted to be on DMR and Yesu doesn't make a DMR radio. Although... DMR seems like it's winning. Oh, yeah, it's totally it's winning. It's totally winning the standards war. So it could be that these people that had competing digital standards might start to make DMR radios in the future. They I might. think it could happen. Well, so we'll see. So this is Motorola, and this XPR 6500 is, uh, uses a digital mode called Moto Turbo which is basically the same thing as DMR and interoperates with DMR. And this Hytera is also a DMR slash Moto Turbo radio. And then this cheap $100 radio is DMR. These three will all work together. The Hyteras have one or two proprietary features that these will not work with. And this one has, I think Motorola also has some proprietary features that yeah. these will not work with. But the regular talking type but stuff. These will talk amongst each other and as I understand it, haven't tested it yet, we'll even be able to do encryption amongst each other. So DMR is totally winning the standards war. I would not get any digital mode, from what I've seen so far, I would not get any digital mode but DMR. Um, Motorola yeah. also makes one, another mode called P25, which is what they really promote for public safety. This is like their high-end business radio mode, but um, some public safety organizations use it. So I would really say start with the basics don't think that you're going to be like this amazing operator because you have an expensive radio yeah. that, in this case, I'm not program. I cannot even use this as anything other than a prop because it's. Well, I have not spent the time to make it programmable. And someone else sent in a question saying the same thing. They did the research on radios. They found a Motorola that fit exactly what they were uh, looking for, but then actually making it work and programming it became uh, too much of a hassle. So. Yeah. Yeah, you, and this is why you have to research the whole part of the system. Don't just find a radio that you like. Make sure that it works with the whole system that you have in mind yeah. and think about that system. Who's going to program the radios? How many are you going to have? How many people are going to be talking yeah. to each other? What kit do you want to connect it to and why? And how are you going to do batteries? Right. Um, let's talk about power real quick because if you can't charge the batteries, then these are all completely useless. Right. Uh, equally so. We've had so a number that's of questions. an important thing. We've had a number of questions on solar. I've done some stuff. Just a little bit of stuff with solar. The little bit I've done says any solar panel smaller than like a square foot is probably completely useless. Yeah. Um, it's actually really economical. If you don't need to transport it, a 100 watt solar panel is like 100 bucks. 
and that's going to generate some serious wattage. As far as things like this are concerned, you could use it to charge a 12 volt um, car battery uh, for like 200 bucks. You could have everything needed to charge a car battery. So if the grid goes down or you know you have a huge tornado or whatever, you could actually have a power bank that could then be used to charge your radios and your cell phone and your flashlights yeah. and everything. So and think about power for sure. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see if there's any other well, questions. Well, we got about 10 more minutes. I did yeah. want to talk about SDRs for a bit. So going back to security and privacy, um, someone that I was talking to earlier raised an excellent point, and that is that the most effective intelligence that an enemy is going to get from your radio is not what you're saying, but where you are. And it doesn't matter how much encryption you have. As soon as you transmit a signal from any kind of radio, that can be locatable. So yeah. no matter how much encryption you have, someone who is listening to RF traffic will be able to figure out how many radios you have and where they are pretty quickly and pretty easily. Obviously, the more... Uh, the more technically able they are, the quicker they're going to be able to figure mm -hmm. that out. And it used to be that sped, spread spectrum and burst communication made it really hard to pinpoint stuff. But now it is so easy to watch all the spectrum and record it that you can say, oh, I just got a blip. I just got a quarter second transmission. And it was right here. It was across these bands. And all of my radio, all my antennas heard it. And so I can direction find it over here. If you're interested in how direction finding works, look up fox hunting. That is a type of contest that ham radio guys do where they put out radio beacons that are tricky to find. And then they use their radio equipment to home in on them. It's extremely cool. Again, it's one of those hobbies that I don't have time for, but it is extremely cool. It doesn't yeah. matter how old and FUD like the guys are who are doing it. It's actually very, very cool. It's a, and it's a really practical uh, skill and capability that actually has some real-world applications. Like um, one of the really cool ways to find a lost drone is to put a little tiny uh, radio transmitter on your drone that just sends out a beep every few seconds, and that will last for days on a battery. And so if you lose your drone, you get out your radio, and the really easy way to direction find it is hold your radio and antenna really close to your chest and then sweep. And when the beeping is loudest, it's somewhere in that direction. And yeah. you go a few hundred yards and you it's do it again. It's not super precise, but it 100% works. And it'll get you. If you can walk it, It'll let you find your drone. So DF finding has some real world and very practical uses. And it's easy enough to do that. Be aware that that's a thing. So I want to talk a little bit about listening and not yeah. just broadcasting. Everybody wants to talk. And that is an extremely important part of communicating. But listening is a huge deal. And listening is very easy. This is an RTL SDR that I bought from newelect.com, New Electric. Um, if you look up SDRs, you will find little tiny USB ones like this, which are very capable for 30 bucks. And then obviously there are things like the SDR Duo, uh, SDRs that can broadcast, SDRs that have considerably more bandwidth and capability. But this will let me see a huge chunk of bandwidth all at the same time. Unlike these radios where you're tuning into one frequency at a time, you're listening to this channel, listening to that channel, this will let you see everything. And it is incredibly cool to be able to do that with a computer uh, or my phone. I've plugged this into my phone several times and just use it as a uh, signal analysis tool, a signal analyzer. Mm -hmm. And... That is where most modern radios are going. Most modern radios actually have a little tiny SDR inside. I'm not sure about these, but the Anytone certainly does. Yeah. And um, most radios are a little tiny SDR, and then the computer inside the radio, the Chinesium confuser, actually does all of the thinking. But when you can actually plug the SDR into a computer and use your own software to look at the whole spectrum that yeah, your that antenna can, can see, then you can do some super cool stuff. So the ability to gather information and data using an SDR, that was tremendous. Remember last time we were on vacation and we were looking at uh, airplane transponders and yeah. ship transponders and watching uh, the drone that we were flying uh, the signal that it was sending all using yeah. a, a bigger antenna than this, but plugged into this same $20 or $30 SDR. That is something that is extremely cool. And I, I anticipate that there will be some changes in radio. 
um, things will get more effective. For example, the, the HF mobile radio that mm -hmm. I bought for 500 bucks has a very sophisticated receiver and SDR inside, but no USB port. So there's no way for me to plug my computer into the SDR that is inside of that radio. I have to go through the analog uh, output and yeah. then plug that into the analog input of my computer to actually listen to the analog signals. But that's changing. The, the newer radios that are coming out are going to start to have digital interfaces because more and more ham radio guys um, want to use their computers for stuff. They want to use software to do a lot of the heavy lifting. There is an HF radio uh, program called ALE. ALE takes so much of the guesswork out of what you're trying to do with HF, like figuring out which bands are open and which bands are performing well and which radios are out there. Um, it will do frequency hopping and stuff like that automatically, which you as an HF operator take years to learn. The software can just do it. The problem is that software isn't built into any of the radios currently, but it's so easy to install and run on a little tiny computer. The radios are eventually going to get more sophisticated, and I think the radio manufacturers haven't been implementing a lot of these changes because the amateur radio guys, uh, it's a pretty small Right. It's a pretty small market. There's not million, There's not billions of dollars to be made off of this market. And they're guys who really enjoyed some of the more experimentational aspects of the hobby. But that is changing. Uh, and I think that a lot of folks uh, in the industry realize that there are younger ham radio guys who are yep. more interested in practical stuff, more interested in digital modes, more interested in using computers for stuff. And I think we're going to start to see the radios get modernized. So yeah. ICOM has a new HF unit coming out. USB plug actually in the radio lets you talk direct to the SDR. It's a, it's, it's a very, um, I would say that the radio is very behind on the times, except that it's, there really isn't any more it's, advanced competitor out there. Yeah. So finally it's here. So that's something that I think that we're, we're going to see some cooler stuff coming out. Um, but right now, it is something that you should start doing your research on because it takes some time to learn this stuff, and you actually want to know what you're doing, um, and you actually want to know what your capabilities are going to be when you build out your radio plan for your entire communication system, not just having one of these, um, mm -hmm. but actually yeah. figuring out who you're planning on talking to and coordinate, coordinating that. Yeah, and, and I think we, we probably should have mentioned it a couple of times along the way, but... These things really only make sense if you have friends <laughs> in your immediate geographic area, like neighbors. That Within maybe a few are, miles, yeah. Yeah, like a few houses down from me, you know, there's a firefighter that I know, and if we both had the same radios, we could talk to each other. And when the tree falls down across the road in between us, and, you know, I can't get out because of that tree, I could radio him and say, hey, are you around? And he could say yes, or... Whatever. We could come up with any number of scenarios where we want that kind of immediate local communication. But if you don't have anyone in your immediate area that you want to talk to, a lot of these radios are, are not really going to help you very much. So um, may, I'd just say make, be making friends with people in your immediate, immediate area, if at all possible. Or, yeah, the most important part of your communication network is the people they're going to be communicating with. Right, and if you don't have anyone to communicate with, it's, it's pointless. So... Just just spend thirty bucks on a listening type radio and just yeah. listen. Yeah, but um, <laughs> we should all be connecting with people. Yeah. Um, so much of communication has become digital and online, and that's great. It's great for sharing ideas and propagating ideas, but it's very hard to translate that online communication into real world practical. Yeah. Stuff like there's we, there's seven hundred some people watching this video right now. I'm so glad you guys are watching, but you're all over. Uh, it's so easy to make a video and talk directly to you guys, but you know, we had a major thunderstorm two weeks ago. Yeah, it was knocked like a, out power all over the place in our area, and it dropped a tree across the road, really in between me and my neighbor. And we teamed up to cut it up and move it. I he chainsawed, and I used my truck and pulled. And yeah, we and got even it though you guys, you know, we like you and you're interested in what we have to say. You know, most it, of you are probably too far away to talk to on right. the Right, and if we right now said, hey, guys, I have a thing that needs doing. Can you come help me? There's no way most of you could possibly come and do anything concrete. Not that we blame you, but... No, I mean, some of you are overseas. And <laughs> yeah, which, so, which reminds me, another thing that I would like to say is um, we've got a lot of questions from folks overseas. 
almost every country has some level of amateur radio licensing, but yeah. uh, I am not kept up with those. So you are going to have to do your own research. We're not. On that. If this, we're talking about American laws primarily. Yeah. Oh, and also American law varies. So like certain ham radio frequencies can be used where we are in Tennessee, but then there's certain slices of the spectrum that are forbidden to be used if you're near Canada, for example, because it would start infringing on their radio t turf. And so it's just, it's, it's weird and technical and you just have to do your own research. Um, but the basic summary I would say is go make friends. Um, definitely get and play with some of these cheap radios at eight or 10 bucks a pop for these triple eights. It's basically impossible to go wrong. The way to buy spare batteries and stuff for them is to buy some more radios. I mean, that's how cheap they are. Yeah. It, there's no reason you couldn't throw a couple sets in your car and, Probably the best way to use these legally is to get a GMRS license for your family. And at that point, um, you might be technically a smidge off because they're not actually Part 90 certified. But you're basically consistent with the purpose of the law and, and yeah. the reason for the law. And there's a lot of research that you can be doing. If you're studying for your ham license, do practice tests. I think those are the best possible way to study. That's all I did before I yeah. got my uh, license was just take the practice tests. Um, Buy a cheap SDR if you want to explore the frequency that's around you and try to see what signals are out there and learn how to demodulate them. And if you don't even want to spend 20 bucks, go to KiwiSDR.com and there's a lot of people sharing their own SDRs on the internet. So you can just log in and have a listen at the spectrum that's near them. So there's a ton of great tools that yeah. you can use to research this stuff, but I would say you have to do a little bit of research. You can't just buy a Baofeng, stick it in a pocket, and have your yeah. communications all figured out. That's not how it works. No, it's... Sadly. There is a learning curve. These are these are technical devices that do take some practice and study to, in order to use. Um, I didn't bring it, but I have a radio. My uh, It's made by a company called Quanshang. It predates Baofeng, at least in the American market. And it's an incredibly durable radio. Um, but its menus are the worst that I've ever seen. You know, like the Baofeng menus, when you turn on the radio, it actually makes pretty good sense as you um, poke through it. You know, you have your squelch level and your frequency step and your transmit power and channel save, vox, wide or narrow band. And you can click through these settings and it's, it's pretty intuitive, everything that's there. Um, if you know, like RDCS, if, if you know what that means, it's, you, you know, okay, that's how I change that. It's... But um, yeah. some other radios, not so much. But even with this one, if you don't know what wide or narrow means, you need to go study that and find out what 25 kilohertz versus 12 and a half is and stuff like that. So um, all this information is available for free on the internet. You do not need um, to go to any classes or anything. You can get very well equipped in just a couple nights of study. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it's a long rabbit hole if you want to go further. Yeah. Well, that's probably where we should end. It's been an hour. It's been uh, There's no more the questions. driest, boringest live yet. Um, but do continue to ask us questions. It's not your fault. <laughs> um, do continue to send us questions on the T-Rex talk at T-Rex-Arms.com email address. We will continue to be taking questions and answering those on, on future lives. Let us know other stuff that you want to learn about, either radio communication stuff or uh, other topics, but also let us know what you think of the live stream in general. We, we tried to balance a conversation and communication. Do you want deeper philosophical content? Do you want more practical, immediate gear related content? Do you want super fast Q and A? Let us know. We're, we're, we're still trying to figure out what we actually do with the live channel. It's, it's fun to do and it's fun to get instant feedback from you guys, which I have been reading, but um, yeah, keep us posted on uh, what your interests and needs are and uh, what you think would be helpful for the future. But again, like David said, go do some study on radio stuff. Don't just go out and buy a radio. Do a little bit of study, figure out who you wanna to talk to, and um, then begin to build out your communication system. So thank you so much for watching the video. We will see you next week talking about something that we'll decide later. Have a great rest of the week. So the other thing that I realized that we should